Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this evening's semi-final debate. My name is Anya Arikatwidi, and I am the chairman of this debate. The timekeeper is Rebe Le Rebecca Lenchetti. This debate will be judged by a panel of three adjudicators, who are Ms. Chaw, Ms. France, and Mr. Morris. The topic of this debate is that politics has no place in sport. The affirmative team, seated to my right, is from St. Dominic's Priory College. The negative team, seated to my left, is from Brighton Secondary School. The speaking time for this debate is six minutes. A single warning bell will sound one minute before the speaking time. And a double bell will sound at the speaking time. Please ensure that your mobile phones are switched off. I declare this debate open and call upon the first affirmative speaker, Georgina Salandra. Good evening, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Georgina Salandra and tonight I'll be speaking as the second affirmative speaker. The topic for our debate is that politics has no place in sport. We, the affirmative team, believe that this statement is true. We define the topic as politics being the agendas of a government, members of lawmaking organisations or people who try to influence the way a country is governed. Has no place as not being able to hold position in relation to other articles and sport as a game, competition or activity needing physical effort and skill that is played according to rules for leisure or as a job. These definitions were all derived from the Cambridge Dictionary. As a whole, we define the topic as constituting how activities of particular organisations are undeserving of a position in amateur and professional organised sport. As first speaker, I'll be discussing two points. For my first point, I'll be discussing the purpose of sport, particularly international competition and how politics does not fit within these ideas. My second point will discuss how political movements such as boycotts are ineffective at creating political change and unfairly and ultimately only negatively impact athletes. Our second speaker will be discussing how involving politics in sports eliminates the opportunity for escapism, how gesture, gesture politics are useless and harm athletes, and finally how political views cannot be used to analyse sport decisions. Our third speaker will rebut and sum up our team's case. My first point is that the purpose of sport, particularly international competitions, does not correlate, 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 correlate with the agenda of politics. According to AthensGuide.org, the original purpose of the Olympic Games was for young men to display their physical qualities and to allow various Greek cities to unite and compete without political conflict. However, this cannot be said for more recent games. Former US President Ronald Reagan stated that it ought to be remembered by all that the games more than 2,000 years ago started as a means of bringing peace to Greek cities, to Greek city-states, and in those dates, even if a war was going on, they called off the war in order to hold the games. This displays how the nature of sporting competitions was developed to unite people and provide the opportunity to put aside their political differences and participate in these events. Unfortunately, sporting events of today are not regarded in the same manner as 2,000 years ago. Nowadays, these events are riddled with politics and are ma manipulated to align with the political interests of a country. This is not the true purpose of sport. The International Olympic Committee advocates for neutrality within sport, evident through the guidelines it has established. Rule 50 of the Olympic Charter provides a framework to protect neutrality of sport and the Olympic Games. It states that no kind of demonstration of political, re religious or racial propaganda is permitted at any Olympic sites, venues or areas. It is a fundamental principle that sport is neutral and must be separate from any type of interference. Spe specifically, the focus for field of play and related ceremonies must be celebrating athletes' performances and showcasing sport and its values. The purpose of sport, particularly international competitions, is to allow individuals to compete against each other in an environment free from political agendas of nations. By providing politics a place in sport, we defeat this purpose, exhibiting exactly why politics has no place in the sporting industry. My second point is that the infiltration of politics in sport, specifically through boycotts, is unnecessary and also negatively impacts athletes. We can see this when we examine the international sporting boycotts throughout history, which were motivated by political agendas. During the South African apartheid era, South Africa as a nation was not invited to the 1964 Summer Olympics due to its segregation. Countries also withdrew from international sporting competitions in which a segregated South African team was competing. Despite the intention behind these boycotts to show international disapproval of South African apartheid, they had no influence on ending apartheid. Rather, it was the build-up of internal and economic pressures that led to its termination in 1944, according to History.com. This shows how when politics in the form of boycotts becomes enthralled in sport, it serves no real purpose and provides no benefits. 
Scott Rosner of Columbia University states that the athletes who were forced to withdraw became un the unwilling victims of politics. These athletes trained hard for years, only to have their dreams of Olympic participation denied by politicians seeking to use the Games for political benefits. Furthermore, the consecutive boycotts of, 1980, of the 1980 Moscow Olympics by Team USA and the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics by the Soviet Union displays boycotts' uselessness. These boycotts occurred due to the ongoing rivalry between <coughs> the US and the Soviet Union, the Cold War. However, these boycotts had no effect on the Cold War's end, which occurred years later in 1991, displaying how political interference in sport is unnecessary and does not assist in resolving political issues present. Additionally, calls to boycott the upcoming 2022 Winter Olympics in Beijing are growing due to China's mistreatment of Muslim minorities in its country. While this is a valid issue, boycotting the upcoming Games would be an ineffective resolution as it does not directly support those in need. Professor David Black from Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia believes that a boycott won't work and would have little influence on creating change in China. If this boycott was to proceed, it would have negative implications on athletes. When a country decides to boycott a sporting event for political purposes, the athletes who have trained for years to compete are unable to protest these government-made decisions. How is this fair? This has resulted in athletes becoming political pawns for the government and their roles being weaponized and used for political purposes. These athletes dedicate their entire lives to sport, only to be turned away from competition due to political issues. Ultimately, politically driven boycotts at sporting competitions are useless, having zero impact on the outcome of political issues and resulting in unfair consequences on athletes. This proves that politics has no place in sport, as it does not align with the interests of both athletes and sport itself. In conclusion, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, we, the affirmative team, strongly believe that politics has no place in sport. I spoke to you about how sporting competitions do not align with politics and how boycotts in sport are ineffective. Sports are meant to bring those of many different cultural backgrounds and beliefs together. However, dismantling the unifying origins of sport with politics and boycotts is incorrect and should have no place in sport. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chairman, adjudicators, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bonnie Miles and I'm the first representative of the negative team. The topic for tonight's debate is that politics have no place in sport. As the negative team, we wholeheartedly believe that this should not be the case. We disagree with the definition of, that the affirmative team has given and define politics in sports as, sport, as sport diplomacy. The use of sports as a mean to influence diplomatic, social and political relations. Sports diplomacy may transcend cultural differences and bring people together, as defined by ProQuest.com. The first speaker has uh, tried to tell you that sport 2000 years ago was created specifically with the idea that politics would be separated. While this may be true, I would like to reiterate, 2,000 years ago, that was a long time ago. The world is changing at rapid paces. Mm. Um, even with the 2020, many political movements have, up, have uh, upraised, and I would like to mention that 2,000 years ago, we were still burning Christians. We were still waxing Christians in, in ancient Greek, in ancient Rome, and lighting them as candles, lighting them as fireworks, all these terrible things we did 2,000 years ago. While this may not be uh, super relevant, times have changed, times are very, very different now, and I think that that should be taken into consideration. Tonight I'll be talking to you about two points, how politics in sports ensures freedom of speech for athletes and how athletes can use uh, this to promote positive change. Our second speaker, Catherine, will be discussing the precedent we set when we speak out against discrimination in sport, as well as, uh, sorry, as well as the inherent existence of politics surrounding certain sports figures. Our third speaker, Rosie, will rebut and sum up our case. Now to my first point. Politics, uh, politics in sports ensure freedom of speech. The sporting field, 
like any office, is first and foremost a work environment. So what makes this workplace different from any other in terms of political discussions at work? Ladies and gentlemen, the removal of political expressions in sports will only silence our athletes and impede on their constitutional right to freedom of expression. Every single person is entitled to freedom of speech. In the, National COVID, sorry, in the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, Article 19 states that everyone shall have the right to hold opinions without interference, and everyone shall have the right to freedom of expression. No one has the right to take away your freedom of speech. So why should this be any different from athletes? Why shouldn't they be allowed to demonstrate their views on important social and political issues just because they are involved in a sport? Taking away politics from sport would disregard athletes and their agency to stand up for what they believe in. Do we really want to be pushing activism back into the shadows? Let us consider a current example. Soccer players taking a knee at the start of Premier League matches. The overwhelming majority of players have agreed that they want to demonstrate their support for the anti-racism message that taking a knee portrays. The taking of a knee is an action first identified by the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States after the murder of George Floyd. It is not compulsory for all soccer players to take the knee before the game. In fact, Wilfred Zaha, a black player for English team Crystal Palace, has refused to take part. But that is his right, as it is also the right of the other players to demonstrate their support for the anti-racism message. The positive response from the supporters of the players' actions, both in stadium and at home, show that politics does have a place in sport. And the important message is being witnessed on television worldwide, discussed and brought to the forefront of people's minds. Both taking a knee and not taking a knee are both political acts. We're not saying that every single athlete should come out and endorse a party or a, polit or a politician, but should they choose to, each and every athlete has that right. This takes me to my second point. Politics in sports has resulted in positive changes being implemented by government in a more timely fashion. The attention brought to a political issue by athletes or a sports governing body has drawn increased attention to the topic and brought about change at light speeds. In 2017, the AFL changed their logo to YES in, su in support of the plebiscite on same-sex marriage. By the governing body of football taking this position, it is generated as an air of tolerance and acceptance within the sport. Support for the YES position showed that the discrimination was not accepted <coughs> in the AFL. According to, the, according to 7westmedia.com.au, here in Australia, the most popularly viewed news channel is 7 News. This channel has an average of 1.4 million people tuning in every day to watch the news. While this may, it may sound like a large number, on the other hand, in 2020, there were 7.5 million Australians aged 14 and up that, tuned, that regularly tuned in to watch the AFL, as reported by Roy Morgan Research Institute. Sport has the capacity to, to reach far wider audiences than the news, or, the news organizations can. And when athletes use this platform to enforce positive messages, why should we take that away? Further consider Pre President Nelson Mandela's actions at the time of the 1995 Rugby World Cup in South Africa. Mandela had just become the president of South Africa after being released from prison after 27 years as a political prisoner, locked up for his opinions and regarded as a terrorist. The South African rugby team, called the Springboks, were viewed as a, leg a legacy of the uh, apartheid, sorry, apartheid uh, regime that had treated black South Africans as second-class citizens for generations. The Springboks were viewed as a symbol of white supremacy, and the most black citizens would support the opposition whenever they played. Mandela openly supported the Springboks at the World Cup, famously wearing the jersey of the white Springbok captain at the final. His action sent the message to the black citizens of South Africa that this was a new time in politics for South Africa and encouraged the nation to come together as one. These are just a few of hundreds of examples providing positive political impact in sport. Had we been so adamant about the separation of sport and politics in 1995, Mandela's message wouldn't have become so wi uh, widespread and widely accepted at the time. Being able to express political opinions through sport allows these people to be more than just their athletic ability national po or national popularity. It allows them to use their platform for good. Therefore, in conclusion, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, tonight I have presented to you with just a few of the countless reasons why politics should have a place in sport. With their inevit inevitability, why not harness it to promote positive change, as Mandela did, and the campaign for freedom of speech? To quote an article... Thank you.
call upon the second affirmative speaker, Isabella Jabal. Good evening, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. The topic for our debate tonight is that politics has no place in sport. We, the affirmative team, strongly believe this statement to be true. Tonight, as second speaker, I'll begin by rebutting the affirmative team and then make points for my own team's case. The first negative speaker has defined politics as only sports diplomacy. We agree with this, but would like to expand it to include agendas of the government and those who influence the way a country is governed, as stated in the Cambridge Dictionary. The first negative speaker has also stated that political ideas are portrayed through sport as it is the best way to access a large audience easily. However, the aim of sport is not to highlight how much better a country's political and economic system is compared to another. Furthermore, sport games are highly inappropriate occasions to share political ideas. When people go to watch sport, they do so for one reason, to watch the sport. People do not come to sport games to hear political ideas and messages, because if they wanted to hear that, they would have gone to political rallies. It is simply a matter of the right time and place. Our first speaker, Georgina, has already discussed how politics does not fit in with the purpose of sport and how political boycotts are ineffective and do more harm than good. Tonight, I'll be discussing three points. My first point is that politics in sport makes it hard to escape from the political turmoil in every other area of the media. My second point is that gesture politics are ineffective. And my third point is that politics cannot be used in analysing sporting decisions, therefore it has no place. My first point is that involving politics in sport eliminates the potential for escapism that many sports viewers prioritise. The past two years have inundated the news with pandemics, protests and politics, and it seems that there's no escape, except sports. Forbes conducted a study on viewers' opinions on sport and politics, with a sample size consisting of Republicans, Democrats and Independents. The only commonality between all of these groups was the agreement that they all use watching sport as a form of escapism from the high stakes trouble of the outside world. The return of live sports in the US after the pandemic hiatus was highly anticipated. However, according to the ABC, there has been a 45% drop off in viewership over the 2019 NBA season from normal numbers, and experts state that this could be due to the recent prevalence of political messaging. Many spectators feel that it is an unwanted intrusion on the game. According to Rasmussen reports, nearly one third of respondents in the survey are less likely to watch an NFL game due to players protesting the national anthem. Fans will easily grow tired of the activism on the court and stop tuning in, as this trend is already emerging. Therefore, politics does not belong in sport as it taints one of the few areas where people can escape from the constant bad news and politics. Politics are divisive by nature, the very reason why it would be wrong to allow it to intrude in one of the only facets of life left untouched by partisan views, where those of many different backgrounds can cohesively root for their team to win. My second point is that gesture politics demonstrated in sport are ineffective, ultimately harm the game and therefore have no place. If athletes are going to bring politics into sport, despite the negative effects I previously discussed, one would hope that there is decent payoff. However, the method most commonly used are gesture politics, which are defined as political actions taken cheaply to influence public opinion that have no impact. Gestures on the field, particularly kneeling, have been progressively normalised to the point where they have no impact on the public. Kneeling during the national anthem is not inciting any meaningful change socially, especially when we have become desensitised to it, and it only disrupts game focus and harms viewership. Footballer Wilfred Zaha states that it doesn't matter whether we kneel or stand, some of us still continue to receive abuse. If athletes feel so strongly, then there are other actions to be taken off the field instead of a symbolic, albeit ambiguous, gesture that disrupts the unifying nature of sports. Gesture politics are doing nothing but harming athletes. If some feel uncomfortable making said demonstrations, it depicts them as outsiders and opens them up to harmful criticism from supporters of the causes. This ultimately means that politics, especially gestures, have no place in sport. If they are not creating any quantifiable or meaningful change, why have the disruption, loss of viewership and negative impacts on athletes? My third and final point is that politicising sports enables decisions to be taken in political context, which ultimately affects players and the game as a whole. Having politics involved in sport means that all decisions must be considered through the political lens of which they will be viewed by the media and general public. This can lead to cl clubs feeling pressured to meet certain diversity quotas, which, according to football club owner Simon Jordan, can compromise game performance. Upholding the game's integrity should be paramount for all those involved, yet this is not the case. 
An example from the recent Euro Cup final saw three African English players step up to kick penalties, a decision from the club which expectedly launched heated political debates from both right and left wing sources. While some believe that the three players were set up as scapegoats for the backlash if they missed, others claim the players were shown were chosen to show a futile gesture of diversity from the English soccer club when there were other players with a higher penalty accuracy, according to the BBC. Despite the intentions of the club, the decision was still viewed from a political point of view and created a divide between sports fans. The players then received a torrent of backlash, according to the Washington Post. This example proves that politics has no place in sport. Political views assume that race, gender, being leftist or rightist, and power all influence decision-making and issues. However, the world of sports could not be more different. Decisions are and should be made purely based on talent and athleticism, and attempting to analyse this with political rhetoric does not make sense. In conclusion, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, we, the affirmative team, strongly believe that politics has no place in sport. I spoke to you about how politics in sport compromises the escapism that is so vital to many viewers, how gesture politics are ineffective and harmful, and finally, how interpreting sporting decisions in a political context is illogical and ultimately determines why politics has absolutely no defensible place in sport. Thank you. upon the second negative speaker, Catherine McCormick. Good evening, Madam Chairman, audience members, and our adjudicators for tonight. The topic for our debate is that politics has no place in sport. We, the negative team, believe that this statement is unequivocally false. Our first speaker, Bonnie, has already informed you of the athletes' constitutional rights to broadcast their political beliefs and the imp positive impact of politics in sport. Today, as the second speaker, I will be talking to you about the precedent that speaking up against discrimination in sports sets and how media reception causes some people to appear is inherently political. Our third speaker, Rosie, will rebut and sum up our team's case. Before I continue, I would like to rebut a few of the affirmative points. The first affirmative speaker has attempted to tell you that the meaning of sports originally did not include politics in its definition. But the original definition included the term that young men were supposed to compete in these sports. But the definition of this has clearly changed over time and adapted to a more modern society. And it needs to accommodate for the political messages and changes that need to be made to accommodate these games for not just the youthful white men that it states, but also adapt for a modern games that includes a simple place for a huge variety of people from all walks of life. They've also tried to tell you that boycotts are not useful, but these do in fact raise awareness and broadcast these at an international scale, which is an important thing to be doing. The second speaker has tried to tell you that sports politics eliminates the area of escapism that sports creates, but this is flawed because these games do not exist in the utopia that this first speaker, second speaker has tried to portray, and that these players are real people who deserve the opportunity to better their own rights and the rights of others and sets a worldwide standard for other people. Um, now I'll move on to my points for tonight. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, when the sports shown on our screen are filled with inherently discriminatory behaviours, it is vital to call attention to it. Many areas of sport are riddled with discrimination based on gender, sexual orientation and race. With this behaviour being broadcasted to millions, it is critical that we use politics to set a strict precedent for what we will and what will not allow to be happening on and off the playing field. The Melbourne Cricket Ground had over 100,000 people watching live as Adam Goods, an Australian AFL player, was called an ape. Not to mention the millions of viewers watching live from home, the 6.3 million people watching the event on the David Peckham YouTube channel, as well as countless other online reports of it. People wanted to separate this political moment from sport, disregarding the impact it had on not just Adam, but the whole Aboriginal community. 
Instead, Goods was able to use his voice to educate millions on the importance of being racially sensitive at a time it was so clearly necessary. This is not an isolated incident, as athletes are faced with discrimination and prejudice daily. New York Times reports that the US women's soccer team in March of 2021 filed a gender discrimination lawsuit against the US Soccer Federation. The lawsuit states that an institutionalized gender bias has led to the women's team being significantly underfunded and paid less than the men's team, even though the women's team performs consistently better. The athletes have stated that this affects not only their paychecks, but also where they play, how often, how they train, the medical treatment and coaching they receive, and even how they travel to matches. The team recently became the world champions, while the men's team finished all the way down in 10th place, according to the FIFA World Cup website's rankings for the 2021 championships. Clearly, the US Soccer Federation values their men's team over the women's team, regardless of talent and skill. Even Carlos Cordeo, former vice president of the United States Soccer Federation's board of directors, has been quoted saying, our women's team should be treated and valued as much as our men's team, but our female players have not been treated equally. These women are within every right to call out this horrendous inequality and prove the prevalence of politics in sport. To say politics does not have a place in sport is to say that these women deserve to be subjected to discrimination in their workplace and that they don't deserve to advocate for better rights simply because they work in a field of entertainment. This brings me to my second point for tonight, which is that the existence of some athletes will inherently be politicized and thus makes politics in sport unavoidable. Removing politics is not only removing their space to speak out for themselves, but further di diminishes their identity. ABC Australia reports that in 2015, the Cover the Athlete campaign began following the Wimbledon runner-up Eugenie Bouchard being asked by a reporter to give us a twirl and tell us about your outfit. These appallingly sexist lines of questioning are very common to see in sports for women and vary greatly from the questions men are asked. The campaign created a video video that parodied how men, male athletes would respond if asked the questions female athletes often hear and <coughs> brought attention to the politicization of women in sport. Their website states that sexist commentary, inappropriate interview questions and articles commenting on physical appearance not only trivialize a woman's accomplishments but also send a message that a woman's value is based on her looks, not her ability and it's far too commonplace. Furthermore, an analysis by the Women's and Children's Advocacy Group found that women receive three times the amount of harassment that men do in sporting commentary. Media and public perception of sports cert use certain minority and marginalized groups as inherently political. These groups are unequivocally deserving to take a place in sport, but to untangle politics from sports is to completely remove these players from the games. Even when we remove all politics from athletes, the outside world will bring it in as sports does not exist in, in, independently from the rest of the world. Politics deserves their place in sport as they allow participants, viewers, and media sources to form their own interpretations. Politics in sports are unavoidable. Everyone has an opinion and everyone always will have. Sports does not exist in a vacuum. While it's nice to watch a match and forget about all that's bad, imagining people aren't affected by politics doesn't help anyone. So, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, can we truly enjoy sport as a form of entertainment if its deep-rooted issues are not permitted to be discussed, dealt with, and broadcasted? Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. The topic for tonight's debate is that politics has no place in sport. We, the affirmative team, believe that this statement is correct. Tonight, as third speaker, I'll be rebutting the opposing points and summarising my team case. Tonight, the first negative speaker has stated that athletes should be able to have freedom of speech like every other job. 
However, the job of an athlete is to play sport, which can be hard to share political views, especially as it does not include any form of communication to audiences whatsoever. Imagine if you were working an office job and during a meeting you decide to share your political views. This action would be considered unsuitable for the situation because you are pushing your personal views on an audience who have not gathered to hear them. The same can be said for athletes. Hence, sharing opinions during sport is inappropriate timing as there is no reason to do so and people can find the behaviour arrogant and disrespectful. We, the affirmative team, are not attempting to silence athletes who have their own political thoughts and opinions regarding social issues. Of course, everyone is entitled to their own thoughts, but the field is not the right place to incorporate politics. If these athletes felt strongly about these ideas, they could still broadcast them outside of games. As our second speaker has spoken about, politics in sport, in particular gesture politics, are useless, as if players are protesting on anything that has nothing to do with the sport they are playing, it is irrelevant and therefore should be kept out as it, as it is simply not the right time or place. The first negative speaker has also said that politics in sport has allowed positive changes by the government. However, the aim of sporting success should be a direct reflection on the athletes and sporting team instead of a government's economic system. The overall intention of sport is to create and should create leisure and entertainment, whether that be in the form of competitions instead of furthering a, a country's economic agenda. Tonight, the second negative speaker has said that the media sets the tone for other athletes to voice their views. However, in certain situations, these athletes might be misinterpreted, not by spectators, but by the media. Even if the intentions of an athlete's gesture is pure, the media can tarnish and portray this in a negative manner. In doing so, it can never be guaranteed that the purpose of the gesture will be communicated properly. As a result, athletes should not perform gestures during sporting events where external broadcasters are available, but instead on their own personal media platforms so they can at least clarify and explain the intent of their opinions and views. Furthermore, as our second speaker has stated, gesture politics do not incite change. The second negative speaker has also stated that underpaid female athletes should be able to protest these issues on the field as they are related to sport. Whilst they may be linked to the game, there are ways to create change other than ambiguous gesture politics which may confuse viewers and not necessarily communicate the message. Athletes have a larger following outside of sports. For such an important social issue, there are other channels to create change and communicate a message. Even in-person protests off-field with clear signage would better inform people of the issues. Furthermore, the issue is divisive even if most agree on it, so it should not hinder the unifying nature of sport. The second negative speaker has said that racism is present on the field, so players are entitled to protest that. Contrarily, worldwide, there have been no incidents of systemic racism within leagues, with many sports, such as football clubs, having a no-tolerance to policy and procedures and regulations to ensure that teams recruit purely based on talent. Instead, reported incidents have only been regarding fans being racist towards athletes, <coughs> such as racial abuse against Indian cricket players in the Test Series, and the recent Tex Walker incident in AFL this year. This means that as there is no political racism present in the game, they are not entitled to protest, hence indicating that these should be kept out of games. This is because racism from fans to players are considered social issues, meaning that players are still entitled to protest that, as per our definition, this does not fit any form of politics. The second negative speaker has stated that sport needs to adapt to a modern setting. However, politics is not the way to do this. As she stated, sport involves people from all walks of life. Therefore, it should be a way, it should be a way to bridge gaps between different backgrounds instead of introducing more divisive issues. Tonight, our first speaker, Georgina, spoke about the history and uselessness of boycotts in, in sport, which either ultimately lead to more detrimental effects or do not help to resolve the issue whatsoever, only attracting unnecessary attraction and commotion. She also spoke about the purpose of sport international competition and why politics does not fit within their ideals and purposes. Our second speaker, Isabella, spoke to you about how involving politics in sport eliminates the opportunity for escapism. She also spoke about how gesture politics are useless and harm athletes. 
Finally, she spoke about how political views cannot be used to analyse sport decisions. In conclusion, we, the affirmative team, strongly believe that politics should not have a place in sport. I leave you with a thought. Sport is designed to unite players nationally and internationally, not tearing individuals apart based on political views. Our world as it stands is extremely divided. Hence, shouldn't we resort to resolving the aspect of our society that brings everyone together instead of segregating it? Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the audience. The topic of tonight's debate is that politics have no place in sport. As a member of the negative team, I think I speak for everyone when I say that we wholeheartedly believe this statement to be false. So the first affirmative speaker has tried to tell you tonight that sports and politics do not mix and shouldn't. This is wrong because politics, in their words, started as a means of bringing peace and was instituted in ancient Greece, which was known for its early democracy. The act in and of itself of trying to make peace through sport is political and removing that would remove the point of competition, whether healthy or not. They have also said that sports must remain neutral. And while I agree that the sport itself must remain neutral, the movements of politics that have been made, the movements and awareness that political acts have made throughout sporting games have not affected the results of the match or which team wins, regardless of what country they're from, what race, what gender, or what they're representing. They cannot change the rules of their sport or how it is played. The first affirmative speaker has also said that boycotts in sports are not useful and have not been proven effective over time as other things have ended this previous, any previous movement without the need of boycotting. Whilst they have not always created immediate action, boycotts have been shown to shift public opinion and cause change over time. By raising public awareness, you shift public opinion, which is what leads to government change. The second affirmative speaker has tried to tell you that sporting, sporting games are no place for politics. As our first speaker, Bonnie, said, seven and a half million people on average over the age of 14 here watch football on a regular basis, just as an example. And whilst that may not be relevant in some ways, a lot of people do not watch the news, they do not read the news, and they're not well informed. Where else are they supposed to find out what is going on in their world if they can't find something through the sport that they enjoy so much? The second affirmative speaker also said that sport is often used as an escape for people who are politically involved. But the inherent politics in sport, even in small levels, has been shown to help children learn and it's part of life. You have to accept that small political movements will always be a part of what you are learning and being involved with. Do, they have also said that because people are desensitised to political movements such as taking a knee in soccer matches in sport, they no longer have the same effect that they once did when upon original introduction. Whilst this may be true, if people are so used to such politics in their sports, what is wrong with them being there? The simple act of saying that you might be allowed to include things that you wish for is just free speech, which is allowed in almost every country and almost universally considered a good thing. The third affirmative speaker has tried to tell you that the job of an athlete is to play sport. Whilst this is true, that's like saying the job of a banker is only to use numbers, that they don't have to speak to anyone else, they don't have to share opinions, or they don't have to think for themselves. If you share nothing as an athlete, you will also lose public interest. It is an entertainment job like any other, and you are expected to work with people, share your opinions, and be a respectful person. And whilst sometimes sporting messages have been misconstrued by the media, that is no fault of the sports person themselves, and it should not silence voices of people who care about what they're saying. Gesture politics, as the affirmative team have called it, do incite change. They change public opinion and sway audiences, which eventually sway the government. 
Like the AFL support of the Yes campaign of, in recent years, it has been shown that by large sporting events proving their devotion to something or that they agree with it, it does change people's opinions. So to sum up our team case, our first speaker, Bonnie, talked about how removing politics from sport would silence advocates for political change, ensure freedom of speech and promote positive change both in sports and around the world. Our second speaker, Catherine, talked about how sports, especially those at a high level, set a precedent for speaking up about injustice and how media representation causes people to appear inherently political regardless, whether it be standing up for basic rights that they are denied through the sport they play or something that affects someone close to them, you will always appear political to someone because everyone has their own personal opinion about almost everything in life and that includes the very sport you play. For example, if you're watching a football match and you think the judge called something wrong or that wasn't a good call by the umpire, that is a political thing to think to some people. And if you're saying that, you are agreeing or disagreeing with what a certain player did. There is no way to remove politics entirely from sport and it seems unnecessary when it has been shown to be a good influence on lots of people and has existed in sport for thousands of years. So, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, we, the negative team, strongly believe that politics form an integral part of all sport. In the words of former Labor, Labor member Meredith Brinman, sports and politics do mix, and they always have. The next time some colleague tells us not to mix politics and sport, I hope they think back to their universal ac action against the Afghan cricket team. Thank you. now come to question time. For the next three minutes, teams are invited to take turns to ask each other questions about the debate. That is, the affirmative team will ask a question, then the negative team, and then the negative team, and then the affirmative team, and so on. A team is free to indicate if they have no questions. I now invite the affirmative team to ask their first question. Okay, so um, your team discussed how you feel that political boycotts are actually effective at producing change, but do you think that that should be prioritised over athletes who have trained their whole lives to boycott Olympics and to push a political agenda, those, uh, those Olympics were boycotted, so you're taking the opportunity away from the athletes. Do you prefer that over going to a boycott Olympics? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, just from a personal perspective, I think that it also influences an athlete's choice. So even though they may have worked really hard and that is terrible sometimes, if a team chooses not to participate against someone because they don't feel comfortable with the actions of them, it, seems, it makes sense to me that they shouldn't have to. Huh? Did you, this is a completely different question, <laughs> but did you find it hard to find sources with your argument that had specific stats? I, um, quotes, that was bit, yeah, I don't know. I think in general this debate is less reliant on statistics because it's more, yeah, it's more yeah, logical, it's more, more, more yeah, logical. Yeah, positive 
well, I don't want to say positive way of doing it because obviously it was a very bad time. I did watch the Euros. It was hell afterwards. Um, <laughs> um, but I feel like that's quite a positive way of, of putting it. Maybe I just interpreted that wrong. But um, we were talking about, I think it was in Catherine's point, about how uh, the Euros and how that was a very negative time and like how that was uh, portrayed yeah. in the media. And no, stuff. But that has nothing to do with politics having a place in sport. It's the fact that that's horrible that there was racial abuse towards yeah. it. What I'm saying is, when people try to... <laughs> 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 I'm 